we have started a project on this. It's to combine these systems, these quality estimation systems with the machine translation itself. So that is something that we started working on this, but I believe that you can work on this for the next uh, few years and there is a lot of things that we can improve there. Yeah, that gets me really excited. I think it's a, a direction that it's going to be really nice. This is the quality aware decoding project that is basically what I just mentioned about what we have been talking about of having these quality predictions about the hypothesis translations. The idea behind this project that uh, Ricardo is talking about is what if we bring the quality estimation or comment already to inside the MT process and then we can make the machine translation aware or more aware about its quality having a signal from a different model. So this is what uh, this project is about. Welcome to Practical AI, a weekly podcast making artificial intelligence practical, productive, and accessible to everyone. Subscribe now. If you haven't already, head to practicalai.fm for all the ways. Special thanks to our partners at Fastly for delivering our shows super fast to wherever you listen. Check them out at Fastly.com. And to our friends at Fly.io. We deploy our app servers close to our users, and you can too. Learn more at Fly.io. Welcome to another episode of Practical AI. This is Daniel Whitenack. I'm a data scientist with SIL International, and I'm joined this week by Ricardo Ray and Jose Souza from Unbabel uh, here at EMNLP 2022 in Abu Dhabi. How are you doing, guys? Hi, we are fine. Hi, good. Yeah. How's uh, EMNLP for you? So, so far, we have been mostly attending uh, WMT workshop. Yeah, and what's the WMT? What does that stand for? Right, WMT stands for Workshop on Statistical Translation. Workshop on Machine Translation. On Machine Translation, but it was, this is an historical acronym because it's actually now a, a conference. It's, I would say that it's the main conference of machine translation and it has been happening for several years. Uh, and it's always co-located with the EMNLP, so it's, it's nice because it's one of the biggest NLP conferences together with the biggest MT conference. Yeah. It's mostly attended by uh, researchers, so not so much about by people in localization industry, but it's interesting to know what's happening in terms of research, the latest uh, approaches and methodologies for evaluation as well. So Yeah, and is that the industry that Unbabel is in? Could you just give people a little bit of an under understanding of what Unbabel is? Sure. So Unbabel is a translation company. We provide translations, trying to unite the best of both worlds, which is using machine translation and professional translators to provide these translations and the best of both worlds, because if you only rely on translators themselves, it's very difficult to scale this process of translation to different volumes of content. And that's why you use machine translation to speed up this process and then you use the translators to correct if necessary. And that's, I, I think, the biggest uh, difference of uh, Unbabel to other companies, which is we are the pioneers to use something called quality estimation to actually decide whether if we should post edit or not the translations. And I guess uh, we, we are big on also evaluation technology, evaluation. And I think Ricardo can talk about uh, uh, yeah. Comet. Yeah. Like what Zed just explained about the difference between combining humans and empty. So if you have a mechanism that tells you that your machine translation output is perfect, then you don't need a human. But f for you to do this, you clearly need a very reliable quality estimation system, a system that receives that translation and is able to give you an accurate score for, for that translation. And that's why uh, and Bevel has been focusing for so many years on specifically quality estimation and also evaluation. Evaluation, it's a little bit more general. It can also include things like uh, metrics where you compare the translation output with a, a reference translation that you believe to be perfect. And it's what people typically use when training models and stuff like that. For the past few years, we have been developing a metric that is uh, being widely adopted by the research community and also the industry, which is called Comet. 
Comet has been very successful in the last two years. And yeah, it was developed by us. Um, we also developed a, a quality estimation framework that was also uh, gained a lot of attraction three years ago, I think. Yeah, 2019 it was. Yeah, called OpenKiwi, which is basically s similar in, the, in terms of the model approach and everything, but it does not rely on a reference. So it's what we use internally for performing quality estimation. Yeah, I think this sums up a little bit. Yeah, that, that, that said, just one thing is that all of this is only possible because over the years, Mbabo established some quality controls for the translations. And uh, this is started by using something, a framework called MQM, which stands for Multidimensional Quality Metric, which is basically a typology and then guidelines on how to use this typology with different phenomena that happens when when translation is made that goes from accuracy, you know, uh, whether the, the translations are ad adequate, if they're fluent, and then there's a whole taxonomy about that. So this kind of evaluation enabled us to accumulate data about the quality of translations over time that we can then use to train quality estimation or uh, metric uh, evaluation models. Yeah, so this seems different. I, I think some listeners probably in their experience with like modeling and other domains or with other data are probably familiar with like a confidence score or a probability. So this goes like way beyond that, right? So just to clarify, this is not like just a, a confidence score coming out of your model like the, of, of translation, but this is actually a, a metric that you're running on the output of your model. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, so explain maybe um, Comet a little bit because that has like gained so much traction. What is maybe different about Comet? Uh, another, you know, popular one I know for machine translation is called Blue. So what distinguishes Comet as different from maybe that or like other metrics that are out there? So like you were saying, Blue is a very well-known metric, but Blue is a lexical metric. And this means that Blue will take the empty output and it will compare with uh, a reference that was created from a human. And uh, usually the typical setup is that we only compare that empty output with a single reference. And as we might know, there are multiple ways to, to translate a specific sentence. So a lot of times Blur will give a very low score for a very good translation because of that. Sometimes it also gives you a very high score for a, bad, a very bad translation because of another aspect of Blur, it's that it's going to give the same weight to all worlds. So if you have a, a named entity that is not correctly translated, it's going to be like one word that is missing from being perfect and Blur will give a very high score. If you miss like a punctuation, the score penalty will be exactly the same, although the errors are completely different in terms of severity. Just one thing uh, to differentiate between, uh, just to explain a little bit more, Blur is that the way that it looks at both the translation hypothesis and the references, looking at the, each word and trying to understand if there is an overlap of each word with the reference. So, and it does that for combinations of uh, for, for one word or for combinations of two, three, and four words, usually, which you call n-grams. So, and then it has a brevity penalty that is basically to penalize if the translation is too small, too, too, too short. So that's basically the rationale. And there is a class of metrics uh, called like that that I think we are calling lexical metrics. Yeah, right? lexical metrics. Yeah. Uh, so TR, which is translation error rate, it's similar to that. CHRF, it's similar to that, but CHRF goes at the character level. So this is a class of things that is very different from Comet, I think. Yeah, yeah Comet takes advantage of uh, the representations coming for large language models, uh, like XLM Roberta. We have been using XLM Roberta. And uh, basically those representations allow you to compare words in an embedding space. So two words that might not be exactly the same, but have the exact same meaning, the Comet will use those representations to output a score. Now, the other thing that we add on top is that we train those representations to be more suitable for the specific task of uh, machine translation evaluation. And I'm saying this because this is a very important difference from other metrics that have also been proposed, like BERT score, where because of the fact that you don't have any 
fine tuning on top. If you use board score and you you say I love you or I hate you, because love and hate will have similar embeddings, the score will be very high when in fact they are the complete opposites. So we start from a pre-training model, but then by training the model with some supervision from human labels on uh, errors, the model learns that I love you or I hate you on, for this specific task, they are complete opposites. And I, I think that kind of splits apart Comet from all the metrics that were being proposed before that either fall into the lexical category or into the embedding category. Yeah, that's great. And you also mentioned um, just in passing, like there was another kind of category of quality estimation that didn't require a reference. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so the idea is very similar to the idea of Comet. So the difference is that when you have access to a reference, which is the case of Comet, when you create the embeddings for the empty outputs, they will be perfectly aligned with the embeddings from the reference because they are in, on the exact same language. On quality estimation, you are comparing it directly to the source. So the embeddings will not align perfectly. And still, what happens is that during training, using human supervision, the model learns to what is correct and what is incorrect, only comparing the empty output directly with the, with the source. So quality estimation serves a different kind of application than the metrics like Blur, CHRF, and Comet, which is usually I want to know what is the quality of specific sentences or translations given their source sentences. For Comet, usually what you're more interested, Comet or, or the other uh, metrics, you're more interested in understanding the difference between models or MT systems. So you're evaluating at some sort of, uh, trying to understand at some sort of um, test set level or evaluation set level so that you can decide whether I go with model, uh, empty model A, B, or C. And then in quality estimation is basically to take decisions on the fly at real time in which I cannot wait for someone to make a reference or a post edition and decide, okay, can I trust this translation? If I don't, should I throw it out? Is that bad that I should do it from scratch? Or I can still give it to someone that can repurpose this and rephrase it, you know? So... They are slightly different in their applications, but this is something that you can talk about, about uh, trends. Uh, they start to, like I think Ricardo was teasing, to um, intersect themselves a bit. I would say that the, the metrics field, so the evaluation on the metrics side, was stuck with blur for a long time. Quality estimation, on the other hand, was, I feel that there were more uh, research and uh, more innovation on that field. Actually, that was our motivation when we built uh, Comet. We tried to replicate what was being done, the state of the art of what was being done on quality estimation. We tried to bring it to the metrics field. And now the modeling approaches are very similar, but it was viewed as two completely different tasks for years. So just, just to give insight on to what, uh, a bit of context on, on what Ricardo said about the progress in quality estimation, so I did my PhD on working on this uh, kind of problem, and I, I finished like in 2015. So I was working from 2012 until 2015 on problems around this. And the approaches back then, they were basically using feature-based approaches like classical machine uh, learning. And with deep learning and access to embeddings and, and now pretty large protein models, this very, very fast shifted to, to this kind of approaches and the performance of these models, of these approaches also are much better than when I used to first work on this. So the quality of these quality estimation models nowadays, that they are very useful. You can actually do a lot of things with them, like I was saying. And yeah, I just wanted to complement that because for me it was, I was not working on the field of specifically this problem for, I don't know, three years, I guess. When I came back to it, it was, whoa, now it's really up to everything, you know. Could 
you explain a little bit? So you mentioned how like in Comet or in these other models, you might be comparing like the embeddings of, of words, but I, words don't always map like one to one between languages. And sometimes I don't know if you're looking at sentences or other things, but could you describe like some of the, I guess, what are the main challenges looking forward that like aren't solved yet in terms of like next steps with quality estimation and things that you're looking at now that you see as, as open problems? Yeah, you actually touched a very nice, a very nice point. It's I wouldn't say that it's not that the words don't align very well, but sometimes what we see is that the embeddings themselves for certain specific uh, words are not uh, discriminative enough. And we have seen some, for instance, if you translate the sentence, this apple costs 50 cents, you translate it to Portuguese and the translation needs, I'm not going to say it in Portuguese, but pretend that I'm speaking Portuguese. The perfect translation would also be 50 cents. But for some reason, the MT might have hallucinated and say that it's 500 cents. So it's basically changing the price of an apple. And this is a critical error in much scenarios. But if you look at the embedding space of the 500 or the embedding of uh, f 50, it's going to be very similar. And it's going to be very hard for the neural network that is trying to differentiate these two things. It's going to be a very hard task because there is no, not enough signal. You also see the same thing with some named entities. And currently, there has been uh, some work, some progress in trying to look at the quality estimation and metrics and try to figure out why they are not working for this kind of very specific phenomena. Actually, yesterday we had a lot of uh, presentations about challenge sets that try to test metrics for this specific phenomena. So in WMT, we have several competitions, several what we call share tasks. And um, inside the metrics share task, where people are trying to compete to create better metrics, there was also a share task that it's, we call the challenge set subtask, where people submit examples that are challenging for metrics. And then the participants from the metrics task have to score those examples. And then we get the scores back to the developers of the challenges for them to an analyze. And uh, a lot of people looked into this and uh, tried to make some suggestions for future work in how to improve metrics for this. So if you guys are interested in this, I take a look at the findings from the metrics task because they, they are interesting findings on, on and pointers for future work in this, this area. One of the problems of this model-based MT evaluation approaches is that, you know, first they are based on the data that the pre-trained models were trained on. So there, there's everything there. There's bias and there's uh, the limited amount or it can be a lot of data as well, but all the idiosyncrasies of that data are encoded in the pre-trained models. Then when you fine tune this for the specific tasks that they, they need to work on, namely quality estimation and MT evaluation, they also ha are limited in, in data in the sense that we have orders of magnitude less uh, label data for this fine tuning process. So this can have its biases and it can have also, like uh, taking the example of Apple, for some reason you, you never seen Apple the company, but you saw only for the fruit. So you start to, every time you see Apple, you translate that to the fruit, you know. Uh, you, you actually say that it's, if the model translates that to the, to the fruit, the evaluation thing is going to say, ah, it's fine. Because in the evaluation data that you used to train the, the model, you never saw, for some reason, the brand. So, and this is related to the named entity problem that uh, Ricardo was saying. So, I think one step, we are giving the first step as a community to understand that now. And, you know, really poke it and see, okay, there's a hole here. Uh, and now the next step is how to, you know, alleviate that problem. I, I don't think it's possible to alleviate, completely solve, but we are for sure uh, will try to alleviate this for these models now. There is a, and there are a lot of complaints also of people, not complaints, but, you know, even us, when we are using different models, not only ours, we see that these models fall short sometimes. And this can be very bad in a commercial setting or even in sensitive scenarios in which if you get two cents and the, translate, the, the model that translated this to, I don't know, two million, that's not very nice, right? You might have some legal implications with that. So, yeah. I don't know, are there other, other open problems? I think, I, I, for me, one big problem 
is that, and, and this is also a trend that we see in the metrics and in the quality estimation task, is that bigger models are, have better predictive power. So people, usually what they are doing is just throw more GPUs at it and, and just train a bigger model. And this seems to be giving improvements as well. But the problem is that not every practitioner can actually use these models once they are trained because they take they need bigger and bigger uh, GPUs, which are costlier, even at inference time. So we actually had a paper in EMT, the European Association for Machine Translation Conference, that was actually making comets smaller. And it's like a diminutive in the name of the paper. The name of the model is Cometinho, which is a diminutive of comet, like very Portuguese, Portuguese, very Portuguese way to say it. And it was also a first step towards that. But I think there is a lot to be done for all the other models and also for Comet. Yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, Cometing was just the first step into that direction. We, there is a lot of things that uh, can be improved in distillation of these models, even the evaluation models like we did for Cometing. And not just for evaluation, we have been focusing this podcast a little bit on evaluation. But uh, on machine translation, you have the same problem. On machine translation, bigger models have been uh, achieving impressive machine translation quality, but it's very hard for everyone to develop those models and it's even harder for for people to deploy those models. Um, we, we face this at Unbevel. We develop our own machine translation systems and we have seen this trend. We get improvements if we keep scaling our empties, but then we have difficulties serving those empties and uh, it's also... We know that not every company has the capacity to build the, such big models like uh, big tech companies develop. So, yeah, it's not just in the evaluation side, but also in the machine translation side. It is like something that people should look forward to. It's without losing performance, how to make these things smaller and easier to deploy. Yeah, and would you say on the, so on the model side specifically, like Jose, you mentioned sort of models getting bigger and bigger. Um, is some people might have seen like nice uh, giphys about like an encoder decoder and one language coming in and one language coming out and transformer models. Uh, but what are, what are some things others are exploring maybe yourselves that like are either um, different approaches or you mentioned distillation and all these other things to make models smaller, but are there um, different architectures or techniques being explored? I think I saw one of your papers, something about like KNN MT or something. I don't know if you can speak to that, but... Yeah, we just, at this moment, there is a poster on the usage of KNNMT for the chat share task. So this is something called, I think this is broadly called dynamic adaptation. And one approach to that is doing KNNMT that rather than actually fully fine tuning one base model, like one of these large pretrain models, you actually just do some data retrieval approach in which you combine the contents of a data store that has relevant data for the use case that you're trying to serve with machine translation. And then at decoding time, when you are assembling the translation, using the translation probabilities of the model, you interpolate these probabilities with the probabilities of words or expressions contained in the, in the data store. So this way you avoid having to fully fine tune a model for each use case that you have. And this is something that we started to research and approach at Ambabo. But I just must say that this doesn't solve the problem of the base model being big. You just avoid fine-tuning it completely. So there's still the problem of, okay, how do I shrink or compress this model so that I can reliably and cheaply explore it for translation? And this is, like you said, distillation, quantization, and other compressing techniques. Just to complement what uh, José was saying about the, the key and nearest neighbor approach, the, and another very big advantage of this is that it's very easy to combine with translation memories, which we know that they are widely used in a translation industry. And this is a seamless way to basically take the MT and make the MT work with those translation memories, because you can build this data store that will help the model to translate the content accordingly. So just to add that also, which I believe that it's very important for the localization uh, industry in general. 
Great. Yeah. Well, we've talked a lot about uh, challenges, I guess, which is, is fun to talk about at a, at a research conference for sure. What are what are some things just like generally about like the machine translation industry or, or Unbabel or other things that you make both of you sort of excited and, you know, optimistic about the future? What are some of those things that, that excite you? It doesn't have to be an MT or, you know, things you've seen at this conference or things that you're following that give you some um, encouragement and excitement about the future of the space we're working? Actually, I'm very passionate about uh, evaluation in general. I think that shows up in my work because I, I mostly work on evaluation. I've been getting very excited with the progress that we have been doing in uh, evaluation. I think um, like we have started a project on this that uh, we it's to combine these systems, these quality estimation systems with uh, the machine translation itself. So that is something that we we started working on this, but I, I believe that you can work on this for the next uh, few years and there is a lot of things that we can improve there. Yeah, that gets me really excited. I think it's a, a direction that it's going to be really nice. Yeah, uh, this is the quality aware uh, decoding project that is basically what I just mentioned about what we have been talking about of having these quality predictions about the hypothesis translations. The idea behind this project that uh, Ricardo is talking about is what if we bring the quality estimation or comment already to inside the MT process and then we can make the machine translation aware or more aware about its quality having a signal from a different model. So this is what uh, this project is about. So we, we have a paper at uh, NACO this year uh, describing that. So yeah, this is pretty exciting and I think in terms of uh, more broad challenges, what I find interesting is that I don't believe that translation is solved. I think a few years ago, some people claimed that there was human parity between MT systems or some MT models and humans and translators. But then what it turned out that the actual translators that were used were not really professional translators. Like, I know English, right? But I'm not a native speaker and I cannot translate everything. So I'm not a subject matter expert on different topics. So I cannot actually, if you give me some chemistry content to translate into English from Portuguese, I, I, I cannot do it, right? So I think what's exciting is to see that the technology is allowing us to translate better and better, maybe compared to me as a non-native speaker when I'm translating some content. But still, there's a lot of, there are a lot of challenges to actually translate very well, very specific content that is, uh, you know, requires very specific terminology and very specific way of actually building the sentences. And what is much better is actually the fluency that these machine translation models are giving nowadays. But what remains is still a challenge is that sometimes the translations, are, they look very good, but they are not on point, so they are not adequate. They are talking about something slightly different or completely different. So I think this is exciting. I mean, nothing, every, not everything is solved, but at the same time, it's encouraging, right? it's encouraging in this sense. So Yeah, uh, great. Well, as we close out here, um, where can people find out more about Unbabel and specifically maybe some of this uh, research that, that's going on? And, and also, um, uh, you mentioned beforehand that Unbabel was possibly hiring as well. Where can people find out about that? Right, so we have our website, like unbabble.com, and we have our Twitter handle, like at unbabble. You can follow our news from there. We are just put up a research blog in which we are going to be uh, writing about our research. This is going to be possibly in the links in your info box, I don't know. Yeah, we'll put it in the show notes for sure. And yeah, um, we are also hiring soon, like we are starting to accept applications for the next year for uh, research scientists uh, in different levels and different geographies. So, so Mbabo, uh, we didn't talk about it, but it was born in, in Portugal, in, in Lisbon. But now we have offices all around the world. We have offices in the West Coast, in the US, in the East Coast, London, you know, and some other places in Europe. And we are going to post this also to give an email for contact for people who are interested in other research that we're doing and, and other works. We don't, we have open positions not only for research scientists, but also for the engineers and other positions that are not technical. So, Well, uh, yeah, thank you, Jose. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, really appreciate you taking time. I know there's a lot of good posters around to see and, and all that. So thanks for taking time. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, that is our show for this week. If you dig it, don't forget to subscribe. Head to practicalai.fm for all the ways. And if Practical AI has benefited your life, pay it forward by sharing the show with a friend or a colleague. Word of mouth is the number one way people find shows like ours. Thanks again to Fastly for fronting our static assets, to Fly.io for backing our dynamic requests, to Breakmaster Cylinder for the beats, and to you for listening. We appreciate you. That's all for now. We'll talk to you again on the next one. Thank you.